This afternoon, <clears throat> we are going to uh, partake in, in this particular lesson, and it will be my series finale for Lemonade. <clears throat> and I could have thought about you know, and, and taught about many other things that plague our society and, and why it is difficult sometimes to live this life. And I could have taught many, many other lessons uh, about how we should treat one another and how we should behave as the children of God. But I started thinking about something that uh, was kind of plaguing me as a human being. And that was, you know, I haven't even talked about what Jesus would say about this life. I have talked about what his sent ones said. And I have talked about what the prophets may have said. But I didn't talk about what he specifically said, um, you know, with the exception of, of what I talked about with the leaders, because God was very, <clears throat> very vocal on that point. But what I was struggling with and what I was wrestling with is because I can keep going and keep talking about how difficult this life is, how bitter it is, and how it has some sweet moments. I was like, I need a way to get out of my lemonade. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I need to get out of seeing the bitter and the sweet which, you know, maybe not, is not necessarily where, where we all strive to be, but, but because I can see both as a human being, you know, sometimes the bitter starts to overtake my life. Sometimes the bitter starts to, to be more than I can handle. And, and then I need some kind of attitude adjustment. And so I was led to this thought about, God blesses us. And I was like, well, maybe I'll talk about blessings. And the more I thought about it, I was like, <clears throat> I don't want to talk about blessings. I know, I know how the church likes to talk about blessings and, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That, that would take me into a whole other series. You know, what are blessings? So as, as it started to roll over in my mind about what has God said to us about this life, I was led to a scripture passage that I have wrestled with from the day I heard it. So it's going to be coming out of, and then I also read it a few times, but it's going to be coming out of Matthew chapter five, and I've never preached this text before. <clears throat> But I'm grown enough to teach it now. Matthew chapter 5. Uh, the series finale is entitled Blessed. Oh, work with me, computer. Come on. So to recap the series... My main objective was for us to identify how our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And the, the lesson series has covered these items. God is the only perfect and best leader, not man. That we should beware of false prophets because they don't serve us, they seduce us. That we should put aside weight that holds us back and not hold on to the bad things or the good things. And lastly, we're going to talk about the fact that God declares that you are blessed. Picture it for all the Golden Girls uh, fans out there. Matthew chapter 5 opens after the temptation of Christ. So he spent his 40 days in the wilderness. His ministry launched at the wedding in Cana. 
He goes and he's tempted. 40 days and 40 nights, he's fasted. And then he's restored because he's a human being. So after that kind of turbulent experience, he needed to be restored physically. And the angels ministered to his needs. And just like every other human being, he had to establish a home. So he made his home in a city called Capernaum. So that's correct. He did not live in Jerusalem. He's no longer in the manger. He's, he's not in Nazareth. He's not in Egypt. He makes his home in Capernaum. And while he's there, he starts recruiting the men that are going to help him carry out his mission of telling the world about the kingdom. So he recruits the fishermen disciples there. And he starts doing other things because his ministry is launched now. So he's going around and he's healing the sick and he's healing the blind. And people start noticing this. And I, I did preach a sermon about how Jesus walked to Mary and Martha's house and how he was delayed. And, you know, so Jesus is not carrying out his ministry on a donkey. I wasn't planning on saying this, but it just popped in my head. So I'm going to say it. He didn't have no jet plane. He didn't have no uh, boat to get on. You better come on now. I have he to come just, on and say, come on. <laughs> he just walked everywhere that he went. He didn't need no entourage to hold his stuff. He didn't have no bios, people, no pictures. He just... He just took his time and he walked and a crowd of people started to follow him. And, I, and if you read the scriptures, you can imagine what they were saying. Is that the one that we saw him lay hands on, on that leper and they were healed? Is, is that the one who did that, that miracle in Cana? It had to be him, right? It was him turning the water to wine. Wait, I heard that he was just a carpenter's son. What is he? There's nothing special about him. He don't even look like, you know, what people say he is. Some people think he's, he's the Messiah. He, he don't even look special. But the people were following him. Because some people were like, I saw what you did. I, 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 I don't feel well. I got a disease. Can, can you heal me, Jesus? Jesus? Uh, other people, are you going to overthrow this Roman government? We heard that the Messiah would do that. Where is your army? Can I be in your army? Can I help you overthrow them? I'm tired of living this oppressed life. I, I heard you were the one. But he walked and he walked to a mount. And a mount is kind of like a little hill and, you know, it, 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 it has a way of elevating him so that when he speaks, his voice can, can roll over the people that were kind of below him. And, and in um, that part of the world, there are lots of little dips and valleys because there's fault lines and stuff like that. So, so he just found a high place to sit on. And the scripture reads in... Matthew chapter five, that when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he first began to teach them saying. Oh, I forgot I had a picture of the mount for y'all. Here it is. <laughs> but before I start talking about what he said at the beginning of his sermon, I want to talk to you about the Sermon on the Mount. In this sermon, he talks about, if I, I skip the part where he, he tells us we're blessed and we're going to go back and look at that. He talks about being salt and light. That he came to accomplish the law of Moses and the prophets. 
the prophet's sayings that he gave us some warnings about how to handle anger, what to do with adultery, gave us some insight on divorce, told us not to make vows that we wouldn't keep, told us not to take revenge on people, told us to love our enemy. And he furthermore went on to say, to give to the needy. He gave a lesson about praying and fasting that, that we shouldn't be doing these things so other people can see it. He talked to us about money and possessions that we should store up for ourselves riches in heaven, not on this earth. He told us not to judge other people because by the same measure that we are judged, that we judge, we would be judged. He told us to keep asking and seeking and we will find the kingdom of heaven. He explained that narrow is the gate that leads to um, this fulfilling place for us, that we shouldn't follow the broad way, that everybody was going the wrong way, that we have to go through the narrow gate. He, he gave us a parable about being good trees, that you know a tree by its fruit. If, if you're going to judge people, judge them by what they produce. And judging not being judging like he would judge, because he already warned us not to judge people, right? So you need to inspect. I heard a, a preacher say, we need to inspect the fruit. We need to look at it carefully. And that good trees produce after their seed, right? That we want to be true disciples. And then he concluded with the parable about building a house on three foundations. And, and making sure that you don't build it in the sand, but that you build it on the rock. That is the whole sermon on the mount people that goes on for pages and pages here okay oh i said three three foundations i got a little excited it's only two it's only sand and rock sorry y'all it goes on for pages and pages and chapter eight reads and when he came down from the mountain the large crowds followed him and right away a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him. So, so that's how I came up with that, y'all, just in case you were wondering, like, how does she know that, that all of that was one sermon? It's broken up into several chapters in my Bible, and, and it is. But at the beginning of chapter eight, it says, and when he came down. So all of that is in the sermon on the mount. And I think that if you look at this, you would you would understand there's like wow. God said a lot in this one sermon. And as I started reading commentaries, it was like this was the declaration of the kingdom come. This is how he really officially kicked it off. This is the, the first documented, you know, sayings of the Messiah. And he covers all of that ground about the things that could capture us, the things that have led us astray from truly being the disciples of God. And also, the commentators say, you know, everything that he covered in this was a slap in the face of the religious leaders at the time. It was like, you all are thinking that these outward things that you are doing make you pious. It makes you religious. It makes you closer to God. And you could not be further from the truth. And he breaks it all down and, and says, you don't need to possess your things. You don't need to worry about other people. 
You don't need to be caught up the way you are caught up. You need to be taking care of people. You need to love people. But let's take a close look at that first part of his sermon. If I can get my PowerPoint to just do what I say do, and it didn't. Now I got to back up. I am going to tell y'all about being blessed, but page up. God said, depending upon, you know, where you were raised and, and who did the teaching in your church, they either said blessed or they said blessed. But blessed are the poor, those who mourn, the humble, those who hunger and thirst for justice, the merciful, the pure, those who work for peace and those who are persecuted. And, and I will actually read the scripture, but let's start with that first part. And this will be my last slide because you, you can, you're going to need to keep looking at this as uh, we go through this part of his sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And as you look at those verses, they all say blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Blessed are in the Greek is this word that I put on the screen. And it, it is those two words together. And uh, I was looking at some, some different things in my concordance and and I looked at all the ways that blessed was used in the New Testament. And there's some, some uh, a different word that's used for when Jesus was feeding the thousands of people and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. When he blessed it there, it really is like he blessed the bread. He blessed the bread. He he said something religious. He said something pious. He gave reverence. You know, so just like we open up our worship service and we bless God, we say uh, religious and pious things. We, we say things that revere the Lord, that honor the Lord, that praise the Lord. So when you read in the scripture that he took the bread and he blessed it, he just, he just gave thanks. He gave thanks to God. It was like, you made this bread, you made the wheat, you gave us the sun, you gave us the air, you know, not that he had to go on and on like, like some deacons pray, not our deacon, but he, you know, he, he didn't just go on and on about all those things. Um, I'm assuming because he just doesn't seem to be that kind of person. He, he's also the same person that told us, don't, don't talk to God with repetitious sayings. So, so that's why I don't think he just went on and on about it, but he did give God honor with, before he broke it and served it to the people, right? So is that's the way that word blessed is used. And there are other instances in the Bible when it tells us that, you know, again, we should bless God. That's a different use of the word. This word in the Greek as you can see on the screen, um, means I'd have to find it where it was used in a poetical way, but uh, because I'm not focused on that, I'm going to skip that part of the definition. But it means to be supremely blessed. By extension, it means um, that that means that you know, the grace and the favor of God is extended to us is another way that I read it in a commentary. That we're highly favored, that we're fortunate, that we're well off, that we are, we are happy, not in the sense that the world brings us happiness, but in the sense of we're not bothered by the cares of this world. So thinking about that definition, that should bring you to a place where I was, where I was like, 
every jot and tittle of the law is supposed to be true. Every word of God is supposed to be true. And I cannot see the truth in this statement. That's where I was 30 years ago. Like, mm -mm. no, no. I, fortunate and well off are the poor in spirit. Mm, mm, mm. No, <laughs> no, but let's look at this. The favor of God is extended to those who are down, troubled, perplexed bothered in their spirit because of the conditions of this world. That's the way we were supposed to read these Beatitudes, which comes from um, some, uh, some other ancient word. The B-E-A-U is about favor. It's about being blessed. So you're fortunate if you look at the world and you say, Lord, have mercy. You're fortunate if you look around and you see the humanity of people and how desperate we need a savior. Because the, God himself said, if you are down, depressed, perplexed, and I don't mean depressed as in clinically, emotionally, cannot get out of sadness, depressed. But if you look at things and you are bothered by it, the word of God says the kingdom of heaven is yours. Because see, then you are seeing through the eyes of God. There, there are songs that tell us, you know, that we want to, we want to be God's hands and feet. And we want to see the world that he, the way he does right at the beginning of the ministry of the Messiah. He tells us, if you can look at the world and see the depravity, you already got the kingdom. You already got the kingdom. He goes on to say that blessed, highly favored, fortunate are those who mourn because they will be comforted. If you can, if your heart can break, if you can cry with your brother, if you have, some commentators said, if you have experienced loss and you know what it means to be broken, if you know what it means to feel like you are not going to be able to escape the grief of the conditions of this life, God tells you, you will be comforted. See, other people who get into loss so deep that they can't get out of it, they find no comfort. They find no comfort because they don't have God. They can't see the kingdom. It hasn't arrived for them yet. But if you have the kingdom, then you know, Lord, I'm crying right now. But your scripture says that one day you're going to wipe all of my tears away. The scripture tells me that every time a tear falls, you capture it in a cup and you're going to pour it out on the world mm -hmm. at the end. That it's okay for me to suffer loss. I can see past the loss then God can comfort me Amen. blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth <laughs> this one got to me this one got to me as I started thinking about it because I just I just haven't let go of the fact that I have to live on the planet with murderous overthrowing people i have no idea if the people next door to me uh, you know have any appreciation for who i am but the scripture tells me that i am highly favored 
because I have a spirit that doesn't want to hurt my fellow man. I have a spirit that doesn't want to kill for the sake of killing. And I mean, that means everything. I don't want to kill the planet. I don't want to kill no animals just for killing them. I'm gentle. And if you are gentle, the word tells us we get the earth. It doesn't look like we get the earth because other people got, you know, nuclear bombs and they got machinery and they got guns and they got threats and they got power and they got everything else. And it looks like they're running the world. And that is what the apostles told us that the God of this world is now in control. But if you have received the kingdom, you know, you have an inheritance. You get the whole planet and you're not even going to get the messed up planet. You're going to get the restored, beautiful, re rejuvenated, made new, made over planet. We inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How many times do we as human beings have to say, don't treat your fellow brother that way? You shouldn't oppress people. You should treat them fairly. They should be able to work and get, earn a decent wage. They should be able to live in houses that aren't falling down, should have clean water. We have to constantly fight on all of these different fronts that we, we should not have to beg for medicine to make us well. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for justice, because they will be satisfied. The righteousness of God will come. And we have to continue our crusade until he makes it all perfect. But the scripture tells us and God told us we will see justice for all. <laughs> justice. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful, fortunate are you, because you will be shown mercy. And that doesn't necessarily just mean mercy with uh, other men on the planet. You know, so if you show mercy, somebody uh, living among us is, is going to show mercy to you because that's a law. But God is saying, if you show mercy, he will show mercy to you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And this one is a hard one. But if you can, if you can so study the word and, and keep reforming your carnal nature and keep transforming, you know, that process of transformation, because you only need to transform one time. But if you could just keep going in that process and renewing your mind, then your heart, your mind, the way you think will be lined up with God's thinking. You will become pure and you will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. It is easy in this world for us to get caught up and want to fight and fight and fight and fight. But our weapons are not carnal. Our warfare is not the same as, as, as what man would imagine. So if you can become a peacemaker, a person who speaks peace to someone's spirit, I pray that you have shalom that you have wholeness, that there's nothing in you that's broken. I, this, this just kind of dropped in my spirit. I, I knew that I was growing as a person when I could say to somebody else who had done me wrong, I don't wish you harm. And, and I'm not bragging. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I knew something had changed in my mind because I realized that I cannot issue out hurt for hurt. I cannot issue out damage for damage because it doesn't heal. It doesn't bring peace. It just makes you more broken. You, why? Because when you, di when you dish out damage for damage, 
After a while, your human nature starts to crave that. Mm. You're like, every time somebody does me wrong, I got to do them worse. That's the law of the street. Mm. Get them before they get you. Mm -hmm. And and when you start walking in that capacity, your ability to love other people starts to diminish. You just start to see people as threats. You just start to be defensive. You never get satisfied. It, it would seem, it would seem that if you just, if you just go ahead and unleash your anger, that you should feel better, but you don't. You get more broken. You know why you get more broken? Because in order for you to keep issuing out damage, you have to keep remembering what somebody did that hurt you. And, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about this is just what I observed. I'm talking from my heart, people. I know that if I wanted to be mad at my ex-husband, I had to remember everything that he did and how I felt and what I wish I had done. And if I wanted to keep issuing out damage, because of people uh, being unfaithful and, and betraying me, then I have to carry that around and I have to remember that. So that when I tell them what train to get on, where they going, how much they gonna pay and how long they gonna stay, I have right, to Tanya. bring all of that animosity with me. You didn't do to me what my ex-husband did, but you did something worse or something like it. So, so damage given out to other people doesn't ever make you whole. It keeps you broken. Mm -hmm. So blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for seeking after justice in God's favor you will be if your heart's desire is to see God's kingdom really established on earth. And the, the mystery and the secret is God's kingdom has come. His manifest manifested uh, kingdom, one that we can see and walk in and not be sick in anymore and not, and not have pains and not have trouble and not have heartache anymore is not here. But the kingdom of God is in us. His teachings are in us. That's, that's um, an interesting way to think about it, especially as the sermon goes on and he tells us that we're the salt and we're the light of the world. God's kingdom has come. So if you're persecuted for righteousness, again, the kingdom of heaven is yours. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you can see, again, the depravity of this life that we live in, and you can see beyond it and have hope and be comforted and know that you are in God's favor, then maybe you can pick up this phrase that we dropped that we are blessed, that we are highly favored. And I'm not saying you have to say it. I'm just saying you can see it in a new light. That because you experience the pain, you are in the favor of God. Because you are in the trouble and you need God, you are fortunate and you are well off. And that is a hard, hard truth for me. It's a hard truth for me because I don't, I don't wanna be feeling <laughs> or thinking that I'm blessed when I'm in pain 
But that's the truth. That's the truth. I'm in some pain right now. And um, I don't I don't know the reason for it. I, I I'm waiting for some insight, <laughs> if you will, on why. And and there's sometimes that I think in our lives we we have situations and we don't know why we're going through them. And we may never know why we're going through it. But God doesn't turn his face from you. He doesn't, he doesn't decide that you're just going through this trouble as a human being because that's that's just what I want you to go through. It's you're going through this trouble and you're seeing things and and you're bothered by it because it's teaching you. As as Pastor Jay reminded us, it's teaching us patience. It's teaching us that in the long run, the only way that we are going to be successful in this life is to do it God's way so that we can have a better life. And he's coming back to establish that. 